Welcome back, everyone. We have been going live all day. We started at 7 a.m. in Ohio. You started at 7 a.m. I started at 7 a.m. And yep. now I'm rounding it out, get to finish it out with my buddy Clovis. Right, 12 hours. And now we are going back to Oregon for the last hour of, uh, of uh, National Farmers Day here. And this is all about the farmers. That's why we're showcasing the farmers and talking to them and letting them share what they do day to day to bring delicious, nutritious food to you. You bet. It's a lot of fun out here right now. It's really bright. It's a be beautiful afternoon. I'm standing in Ross's shadow so I can actually see the camera. Okay. Well, that's good. All right. Hey. We were we were we were talking about the cows, and now I, I think that's the wrong species in the back. I, I'm pretty sure that's a chicken. So. Possibly. <laughs> yes. And, and I'll let I'll let Ross. Oh, by the way, welcome from uh, Monmouth, Oregon, the National Farmers Day. Uh, you know, we, we do multiple species here now. Uh, Ross has added chickens into the rotation. So uh, before the cows start coming down the lane, uh, I will let Ross take over from here and uh, tell a little bit about the chickens and what they're doing here. Hey everyone. Uh, so the, yeah, this is my little uh, flock in the background. I don't know how well you can see those little, little girls down here. Uh, but yeah, I have uh, added chickens to our, our rotation grazing rotation um, basically they are they clean up the fly larva after the cows graze um, so it helps the cows uh, with the stress because flies stress the cows out a little bit um, these chickens love scratching patties and uh, eating the fly larva out of them so uh, yeah I moved these uh, chicken tractors right behind me uh, three days after the cows graze so we get the beneficial bugs a little bit of break so they can get into the the patties and break it down a little bit more than uh, the chickens have at it. Are those those chicken coops are on wheels? Am I correct? They're like a train. That's correct. Let's go get a little yeah, it's a it's a wagon. Hay wagons I actually designed them off of. Um, just inspiration from YouTube University itself. Uh, oh yeah. It's a bunch <laughs> of different farmers gave me uh, inspiration, and they're just uh, hay wagon frames, and I designed. Uh, the coops off of them and so we have the front one is a is the water and i have a little dust bath in there for them so they can you know rummage around and shake their feathers in it um stores any any kind of you know necessities i need for the chickens and then the other two are the coop areas with shade and the nest boxes but yeah i call this the chicken tractor train nice nice and you built it just to be clear you yourself yeah. yeah, I did. I did a lot of a lot of little small hours after doing doing cow stuff. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, so, that's, that's right. So Custom Ross, built, work Ross, never ends. Ross is actually handy. Ross is handy. I'm <laughs> I'm a rocks and sticks kind of a guy, so I can't I can't build anything. Uh, it'd be hard for me to build a hay fort. So Ross is a guy who who uh, does a lot of building and and sometimes fixing. So um, yeah, it works well on the farm having that. Ross, I understand you remodeled a barn just so you could marry your wife in it. Is that correct? <laughs> yes, I did. <laughs> the barn That's was a little beautiful. shabby, so I, I figured it was uh, put to good use by getting uh, love involved. So Great motivator. Oh it is a good motivator for sure. Right. We have a question online. Uh, how many chickens do you have? Yeah, so I have about 250 laying hens right now. Uh, they're just primarily for egg production. I sell at farmers market and uh, roadside stand, um, and and few bakeries I guess locally. But yeah, I just was trying to uh, diversify the farm a little bit, but um, more of a benefit to the ecosystem I'm looking at um, than trying to make money off of that. Now, really, a particular question: What does the sign say on the tractor train? <laughs> Inquiring minds <laughs> want to know. Yeah, sorry. Sorry if the camera's a little shaking, my arm's getting a little sore. Uh, yeah, so it says farm stand ahead, uh, pasture raised, organically grown. Uh, so when the chicken tractor's by the road, uh, the cars that pass by can see it and uh, know that there's something ahead that they can look forward to buying eggs at. And so there's there's an insight there, right? You talked about you know building a barn so you could get married. You built the tractors, you have the sign. Marketer, you're a marketer. 
you're a builder, you're a farmer. Farmers like are jacks of all trades. It's really amazing. And, I, and, and that's, and that's actually uh, not uncommon. I, I think is that you, there are lots of different things that you do to uh, make the farm viable, to make ends meet. Um, you know, so maybe like talk about, you know, the, the chicken. So it helps with the pasture, but it also helps with diversification for the farm. Why is diversification uh, important for the farm even beyond just the, the pasture and the different animals and what they bring to the, to the mix? Well, it, tur it turns out uh, the whole system is so much healthier uh, when you add in a whole lot of diversity. And, that, that, you know, the pasture species will have, will have 12 different things growing in our pasture at once. Uh, and that adds to the soil health and the health of the cows and, the, and then the health of the milk that they put out for people to consume. So uh, anytime we add in more more diversity, it's really beneficial, whether that's human, uh, whether it's insect, uh, animal, plant, you know, we're adding, we're planting trees uh, in rows through all of our fields to add some diversity, not only for wildlife, but for shade for the cows. So, uh, and the chickens, by the way, love, love the trees because uh, uh, they were born in the tropics. Uh, they're a tropical animal that really <laughs> loves to go to trees. So uh, yeah, it's any anytime we can throw more stuff in, we add more in, uh, more comes. So the more plants we get, the more trees we get, the more insects we get, the more birds we get. Everything just uh, builds on itself. How long have you guys been farming that way? Has it always been that way, John, or did you kind of evolve to get to that point? Uh... No, we we started we started organically farming here uh, twenty. 25 years ago, we made the transition. Uh, we've been shipping milk to Organic Valley going on 24 years now. So, uh, so the first eight, eight years, we, we were conventional farmers. So which came first, the chicken or the cow? I don't uh, think that's how it goes. <laughs> I mean, on your farm, I mean, of course. I don't know what you guys are talking about. So. Def definitely, definitely the cow here. That's uh, okay. definitely the cow. The chickens are window dressing, I'd like to say, but, uh, you know, they're all part of it. But, you know, all this is just part of uh, a great big experiment we got going on here. And it's been a really successful experiment. You talked about all the parts and all the animals and how they work together. What are some of the like animals that you wouldn't think of that might be out there in the pasture and big and small? Well, there's there's blue herons uh, that are constantly uh hunting voles, which are another animal that's out here. Voles are a little small, uh, tailless looking mouse looking thing. And uh, they do a lot of damage to the fields and, uh, and at, at too high a levels, by the way. At, at a, a small amount of levels, they do some good things out here, uh, but too high levels and they eat all of our forages and, and kill the fields. So we have a lot of things that come in to hunt those and uh, so blue herons are one that over half their diet they consume are, are those. And we have coyotes eating those. We have uh, um, sometimes a raccoon will eat the voles, but uh, skunks eat the voles. Um, bobcats eat the voles. Hawks. Sucks owls. to be a vole. I guess. Yeah, <laughs> that's like... <laughs> what? Well, they, they, can, they, can re they can reproduce every 21 days. You so, can start with one pair where of are the cows. Oh, they're coming. They're coming. Yeah. We're heading, okay. heading over. Yeah, the, the cows are actually, uh, so they're, they're being milked currently, and my brother's letting cool. them out uh, so they can come to the pasture. So they're actually coming down the lane right now. So we're going to meander over there so we can watch them uh, come cool. down the lane and into a fresh new piece of grass because uh, we rotate cows every 12 hours to uh, new forage. So nice. tonight they'll have some fresh salad to eat and uh, be pretty happy. So yeah, we're so, walking along the tree line right now. If you can see the trees, oh, yeah. trees ahead. Why don't, you, why don't you show us the trees? So we have a whole bunch of different types. We're just passing a filbert tree or a hazelnut tree. We have a lot of big leaf maple that are starting to grow. Uh, Ponderosa, Valley Ponderosas. Um, some red, red uh, cedar, uh, western red cedar. Uh, so a whole bunch of different mix of things. Uh, some apple trees in the line. 
Uh, so some of it's going to actually produce some feed for the cows. It'll produce shade for the cows, but some of it will actually produce some, some feed that the cows will be able to eat. And uh, What's that and, called? And wildlife. What's That's it called? called silvopasture. Silvopasture. It's called silvopasture. Silvopasture. Interesting. And this, this is kind of, sometimes silvopasture is meant mostly as feed for cows, uh, as well as a little bit of shade. This is mostly about shade and a little bit about uh, some feeding of the cows. Nice, nice. That's cool. They have so many diverse ones. You didn't just plant like one type all the way. I'm, I'm sure the wildlife will appreciate that because it gives a lot of little habitats. Well, uh, so a lot of times cows get a bad break uh, for, for carbon that they put to the atmosphere. But uh, the rest of the story is that we, we produce a lot of carbon that gets uh, deposited in our soils. And the way we do that is by having a lot of diverse species out here that uh, are constantly setting roots down in. The other part about it is the plants actually take in sunlight, produce sugars, and at night the sugars go down through the leaf of the plant into the roots of the plant and feed the microbes in the soil. And some of those, some of those uh, sugars then get back up during the daytime, but most of them are, are left down in the soil. And that builds a lot of microbial uh, girth, I should say. So you get a lot of things growing under the soil, which are then depositing carbon down there. Uh, the roots, is, as the cow grazes them, quite a few of the roots will slough off and, and basically die and then be re, regrown as the plant regrows. And every time you graze the, the plant off, some of those roots are deposited in the soil, which is a really good source of carbon too. So our farm is one big carbon sink where we're constantly producing carbon that's driven down into the soil and, and stored there. Now, the great part about that is when we put that carbon in the soil, it makes great things happen for our farm. Like it holds water better, holds nutrients better. So everything becomes richer and better on the whole thing. I like to say the carbon that we have here is really our bank account. So every bit of carbon that gets put back into this soil and increases organic matter in our soil is really our bank account. It's what we, uh, it's what we live on because it starts growing plants a lot earlier in the spring. Let's meander over where the cows are coming down the lane now. Yeah, those cows look beautiful. Yeah, that's fabulous. And I love it. You just added another title, uh, you know, to your jack of all trades, John, you know, scientist, uh, carbon banker. I mean, you just keep, the list keeps going. Teacher. Like that was uh, one of the clearest explanations I've ever heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> it was really clear. I get it fully. That's awesome. Um, so tell us a little bit more about the cows. How many do you uh, do you milk? Uh, talk about the breeds a little bit, and um, maybe and if, go ahead. Don't step in those shiny cow patties. I can see them That's passing right. by as you walk, and so I hope we got your boots. Those, on. those yeah. shiny cow patties we have, those shiny cow patties we have, are adding carbon into our soil. There you go. Speak. So it, it, it's what's it's what's feeding these plants for the next nice. time the cows come here. So you'll see these cow patties now. By the time we graze this, which will be in another 34 days or so, there will be no sign that there was ever a cow patty out in this field. And that's exactly what we're aiming for, is to make sure that those cow, cow, pot, cow patties are being absorbed in through insects eating them, as well as the plants consuming them and having it taken back into the soil. And uh, so the other part about this grazing is the better the plants are, the better quality of the plant that the cows are consuming, the better quality of the manure that's coming out the other end, which it in turn feeds the soil better. So we really need to have plants that are, that are young and tender and high in sugars and proteins. And then that makes for good manure. I know most people don't really worry about how good the manure is, but uh, it's really important for what we're doing here. Can we see that line right there? Oh yeah. Yes. Clearly. It's, uh, it's, it's where they grazed this morning. So we were just walking on the uh, early morning grazing and then that dark, nice, lush green grass there. 
that's uh, the, the feed for tonight. So that's what they're on right now, uh, eating away. And when they come out of here tomorrow morning, that will look like where we're, where we're standing and what we've been in here right now. So that's, uh, that's, our, that's our job is to every 34 days or so, get that grass growing so it looks like that. And, is, and so you know there's a lot of roots that are being created and that there'll be all that deposit of organic matter. The are the soil. cows at all picky yeah. about the plants that they eat? And do you plant specific, do you seed certain varieties or like, or is it just naturally coming we up? No, we seed all sorts of different plants. So we, we seed several different varieties of grass. Perennial rye grass, they like the best. Orchard grass, they eat it okay, but it's not their favorite favorite. Uh, we plant some brome grass, uh, uh, an Alaskan brome, which the cows really like, and it reseeds itself out here. Uh, we plant uh, clovers, a couple different kinds of clovers. We plant chicory and we plant plantain, which are a broadleaf plant. And I'm gonna go pick one here or two. Maybe just bring our camera down by all that lush grass and one of those cows eating. We'd love to get a see it in action. Get close up. That's the plantain I have in my hand there. But this is actually a weed. And but I don't call it a weed because the cows eat it. So anything that the cows eat is not considered a weed out here in the pasture. And I actually plant uh, play a game with uh, school kids who come out here called Weeder on Purpose. And I'll pick all these different plants and hold them up and ask them if it was a weed or on purpose. And then we have a discussion about what it's doing out here and what it's doing for us out here and what it's doing for the soil out here as well and for the cows. So some things that are, this is a, this was not planned on purpose that came on its own, but right next door to it, there's a dandelion, which also was not planted here, but it turns out cows will seek out and eat dandelion. One of the first things when they come in the field. So all these things uh, just add to the salad bar we have going on out here and, and what the cows eat. And so our cows are, we have about 140 cows out here on the pasture and we put them in about an acre and a quarter per feeding. So they're pretty tight. By the time milking's done, this area that, the, that we've given them will be pretty tight with cows and they'll be all eating and they don't really roam around and look for their favorite because they know if they roam around too much and looking for their favorite, their friends are going to eat all their stuff. <laughs> so they pretty much put their heads down and get busy at it. Nice. So nice. I heard they like dandelions. So I'm hearing a solution for the dandelions in my lawn. So I just need a cow yeah. and then the dandelions will be gone. You need a cow. You um, get a cow, uh, you'll, you'll get fertilizer too. Fertilizer too. Uh, hey, we have a question from Nancy online. How much of the year uh, can the cows be on grass at your farm? Well, we have the cows out as long as the weather permits. So most years we get out in sometime in March, hopefully middle March uh, at the latest. Uh, and then we're able to keep them out until the weather really breaks down in the late fall. So lots of years we'll go to the uh, first or second week of November. So we're in the we're in the barn for about uh, four months out of the year uh, because in the middle of winter time we can't have the cows out here on pasture because nothing's growing. I like to say if your lawn's not growing, we have nothing to feed the cows out here either. Uh, and so that's why we do a lot of harvesting of extra feed in the springtime in order to uh, make this uh, make the winter time uh, work for us so the cows have something to eat when they're in the barn keep the hearts coming keep the comments coming i see one really glowing uh glowing comment here that um from a familiar name i'm not uh, i'm not sure people realize how special this organic milk is grown in such a diverse grass-fed system most non-organic cows never get out on grass at all thank you ben Sims, and thank you organic valley from nancy hirschberg actually one of the founders and pioneers of organics um she helped co-found stonyfield so thank you nancy um that's a compliment all right and, 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 and i didn't pay nancy anything for that compliment yeah <laughs> <laughs> Uh, there was a question on the road. You talked about the rotation, rotating every 12 hours, 34 days before going back to a given uh, paddock. 
So we have about about 140 cows grazing at any one time out here with the milk herd. And yes, we do have 68 paddocks, uh, but however, uh, they're not permanent paddocks. So we use something called polywire, which is a plastic wire woven with some, uh, some uh, uh, stainless steel in it that conducts electricity. And we can put up those fences wherever we want to make the pieces whatever size we want. So that gives us a lot, uh, a lot of what I've, my job has been in the past is to take a look at the pastures and say, okay, there's this much feed. We need to make this many pieces out of this field. So these field, the field we're standing in here right now is nine acres, but it'll be cut into seven pieces uh, because there's a lot of feed right now. Sometimes parts of the year it'll only be cut into five pieces. It just depends. So we just, I just play that game about, okay, how are things growing? We have to really uh, watch the weather, see how that's impacting growth. Times of season are different. It slows growth, growth slows down a little bit during the hottest part of the summertime. Uh, in May, it's like a bonfire out here because everything's growing so fast that, that it's hard to keep on top of it. And sometimes we actually have to take a field out of rotation and harvest that feed for winter time just because otherwise we'd be chasing after feed that wasn't really the highest quality. So uh, that's a really big part of what we do is look at what's happening out here and adjust accordingly. So, and, and the fact that we have those poly reels allow us to set the fields up to whatever size we need to. Okay, and we have a question about cow digestion, um, which is like once that cow eats grass, right? Um, how long does it take it di to digest is the first part. And the second part is do cows get constipated, um, which is coming from uh, my own child, I can tell. So behave in the comments or we're going to have to block you. <laughs> uh, most, most of the time, cows do not get constipated, thankfully. Uh, the cows will eat on average about 300 pounds of forage a day of grass, of wet grass. So 300 pounds of that goes down into their stomach. And they have four different chambers of the stomach. Some people say they have four stomachs. It's just one stomach when they're born and it, and it specializes into four separate chambers. And the biggest one is, is the rumen. And the rumen is where most of that feed sits. And, and basically a cow is a large fermentation vat on four legs because that rumen is holding hundreds of pounds of feed and that's where the microbes, that's where all this microbe stuff comes in. The microbes are helping break that feed down. In fact, the cows would die if the microbes weren't in their stomachs because they can't actually eat the feed. They can't, they can't digest the feed without the microbes. The microbes are a necessity. They're ruminants and they have to have those. And so uh, that feed goes down into their rumen. And then, so a cow does three things a day. She sleeps for eight hours. She eats physically like these cows are doing right now, just physically pulling the grass off of the plant. And she chews her cud uh, or ruminates about eight hours a day. And all rumination is, is where the cows burp the feed back up from their rumen and chew it finer. And when they do that, it chews finer and it adds saliva into the whole mix, which makes their stomach less acidic. So you don't have an acidic stomach, you have a base stomach. And, and so when they do that, that makes for a real healthy rumen because the, the, the little microbes in the, in the stomach don't like it when it's acidic down there. So all this thing is all playing in amongst itself. So the microbes are so vital in our soil, but they're absolutely so vital in the cows. And some of that's interplay between the two is the cows eat and then they poop and that goes to feed the microbes that are in the soil to make those healthy. So this whole thing is really a microbial driven system. And, and so much of that uh, depends on how, how good a feed we're feeding the cows because we need to think about what the microbes like best uh, because that's what the cows like best. That's amazing. So that that that's great. If you were, it's a fascinating description of the digestion. If you're eating at home, it's dinner time in a lot of places. I hope you're still okay. 
uh, but <laughs> we got a great description. Um, and then now we've, uh, we just lost the cows, it looks like. Um, and I was going to uh, try and I was hoping we we're going to zoom in um, get... and see. There we are. OK, because those are beautiful. They are uh, light brown. Uh, talk to us a, a little bit about the breed, John. Like, what do, what do you have and, and what is that breed? Why do you have that uh, that particular breed? Uh, many are purebred Jersey bloods. Uh, but uh, we've used a few crossbred bulls from New Zealand as well because New Zealand really uh, has focused on grazing animals, which are the genetics we really need to make this whole farm work. Uh, and those are half Jersey and half Frisian. So the calves, these cows that are a little darker out here are three quarters Jersey and one quarter Frisian. And I thought part those of the were the chocolate milk cows, John. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. a good one, I know. Well, I know, but I'm bummed. I, I won't <laughs> find you for that joke. I promise. All right. <laughs> but, but, but we, uh, we, uh, uh, we have uh, the Jerseys have been in our family for uh, four generations now, five generations for Ross's generation. So, um, you know, part of it is I just kept doing what my family had done in the past. But mostly I kept doing it because it was a smart thing to do because these jerseys are a, a less heavy cow, lighter cow. So they're easier on soil for soil compaction and they are the champion grazers. They absolutely love to graze and, and that's what we do here. So they work perfectly in our system. Plus they produce a higher level of butter fat, uh, which makes for a creamier milk and higher protein levels in the, in the, and that's where a lot of the nutrients are in your milk is in the butter fat and the protein. So uh, for that reason, that's why we milk jerseys. Plus, I'd probably be thrown out of the Banson family if I milked anything else. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a favorite cow there, John? My favorite cow is no longer with us. Rosie has, Rosie has left after 20 years of being wow. on the farm. Uh, and really, uh, today, uh, Ross is the day-to-day -day manager down here at the farm. So I guess it's his turn to have favorite cow. So you better ask him that question. Ross, you got a favorite cow? Yeah, uh, I enjoy the cow, Linden. Uh, I don't see her out here right now, actually. I think she's probably still waiting to get milked. Uh, but here's another one of my favorites that's in the background that we've been, I picked out. Uh, her name's Vanya, this black cow right here. Nice. But yeah, she's a beautiful little cow. I've I've always really liked her ever since she was a little little calf. So, um, and the cow yeah, just they, to her side there has a lot of speckles and unique markings. Yeah, that one. Is that yeah? Is that like would her mom have a lot of unique markings? Do they pass that on, or is that just kind of random? Because some of them will be pretty stop. plain, and some of them will have like very unique markings. Some some do. Some some will pass that on. That cow in particular has a little bit of that New Zealand uh, Frisian genetics in her. She's only about maybe an eighth or a sixteenth, but uh, that bloodline is very is very uh, uh, prominent at at throwing different colors. Oh, so uh, that's Iran. Yes, that's Iran. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, so you know, jerseys have always even purebred jerseys. Uh, come in a whole bunch of different shades, some with white on them. Uh, the classic jersey is a nice dark brown with kind of a, a black trimming on her face. That's kind of the, your classic jersey. So that one that Ross was talking about that's his favorite, she's a classic looking jersey and she comes down here and you get to meet Linda. She's also a pet, so she always wants to be scratched. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, here's an online question. Have you ever given a cow a bath? <laughs> How do you clean the cows? I guess that's really the root of the question. Uh, well, we, we actually have uh, three cow brushes installed up at the barn. And they're these huge brushes that that stand upright. And and when the cows touch them, it sends, sets off an electronic signal and the brush starts to turn. And so the cows can can brush their entire bodies, backs, stomachs, heads, tails. They especially like their tails uh, up at the back of their tail where they can't reach. They love that scratch. So that's really kind of like a cow bath right there. 
Yeah, I say also uh, the, the pasture is actually uh, is a really good cleaner of the cows too because these grasses sometimes are pretty wet and they walk through it and it it cleans them off pretty well actually uh, their their legs and their bodies. So uh, pasture is actually a natural bathing mechanism as well. We have two questions that are kind of in the same vein. So one from Jennifer and one from Catherine. They're both kind of wondering like why you chose to be an Organic Valley member and what you love about being a part of the co-op. Well, uh, I chose to become a Valley, an Organic Valley member because uh, your father, Clovis, came down my driveway when I was a young, impressionable <laughs> lad. He, he, he did, and, yeah. <laughs> and, he worked, and he worked his charm on me. Uh, well, the real reason that we, we've stayed with Organic Valley, though, after joining, uh, was because of the people, uh, not only the, the employees, but the farmers and the mission. Uh, we're awfully proud to be part of something that's really working at at keeping rural America uh, viable financially as well as as uh, as well as environmentally. So the whole the whole mission was what really drove us to want to be with Organic Valley and stay with Organic Valley. And uh, it's been a good run. It's been a really good ride for us. That's awesome. All right, should we hit the silo? We have a silo oh, here. Yes. I don't know if you guys are aware, but this thing has random questions in it that nobody knows. I was uh, I was waiting for a random question. I was. Yeah, I bet. Um, here, I'll let you go. Well, I, my random question, not in here, is: Do you have a favorite cow joke? Oh, that's that you can tell, that you should tell. <laughs> <laughs> This is the dad, uh, is the dad joke oh, my, space. Yeah, I know. I know. My my uh, my father-in-law was the king, is the king of the puns, and uh, he had about a million cow jokes. He would, uh, uh, every time he would see me, he'd say, now, that's that's someone who's stand outstanding in his field. He'd always have yes. to use that one on me. Uh, Man, yeah. Uh, in his field. Yeah. Yes, and and he would, as he as he left left the farm every time and had to travel back to where he lived in the Midwest, he would say he loved us for heifer and heifer. That was always on the top of his list. It was, uh, yeah, 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 a lot of them. I'm kind of slow, I think, on that one. That's good. That's good. I like it. Okay, so I, this is great. I'm I randomly picked this, and this is fabulous because I am the cheese brand. Your your cheese brand manager, John. Um, and it says, how do you eat your stringles? You know, our string cheese. Do you peel them or do you bite them? Uh, I, I'd have to say I'm a biting kind of guy. My kids probably would be peelers. Okay. You'll have to ask Ross how he eats them. Okay. Yeah, I, I definitely I definitely peel them. Yeah. Okay. I'm a peeler. All right, so yeah. that's not a genetic thing. Okay, no, it's not passed doesn't... down. Okay. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just curious, like, look around, like, you have this beautiful green landscape. I keep seeing this, these really tall pine trees and then shorter trees and you have mountains in the background. It looks like a national park out there. Can you tell us a little bit about, like, where you are in the world? It's just gorgeous. So we're in the Willamette Valley of Oregon, which is in the northwest corner of Oregon. And uh, the Willamette Valley is known for having a Mediterranean climate, which means pretty much all of our, it stays fairly, um, fairly, I should say, uh, mild in the winter time where we mostly stay in the upper thirties and forties and rain, but we get a lot of rain. It's just raining sometimes, sometimes almost every day. When, when my wife moved out here with me after we got married and she grew up in Nebraska, uh, the first winter she was here, we had 60 straight days of rain, and and I thought I was going to have her leave me and move back to Nebraska, but uh, <laughs> luckily she stayed with, and uh, and it's been 38 years she stayed out here in Oregon, and now she wouldn't go to Nebraska, back to Nebraska if you paid her because she just loves loves the weather. You just got to get used to that winter time darkness, and uh, and so uh, but in the summertime it stays reasonably uh mild as well so most days we won't really get past the 80s much every now and again we'll get a he little heat wave that comes in and uh 
and hits us with 100 degrees. But most of the time, we're in the 70s and the 80s through the summertime, which is really good for the cows. Yeah. And and we have a lot of natural beauty here because we're sitting right here on the coast range. So uh, probably can't get the full view from the uh, camera phone, but we have a beautiful coast range right to our uh, right to our west. And uh, so that's that's uh, just about uh, 40 miles, 30, 30, 35 miles as the crow flies, you'd be at the beach. And then to the east of us, which you can't see it all from here because we're below our little rise here, are all the mountains uh, that make up the Cascade Range. And between the Cascade Range and the Coastal Range is where we're at in the Willamette Valley. And it's a very fertile little valley. Uh, some of the best farmland. It is the best farmland in Oregon. Uh, so the soils are really naturally pretty fertile. Our job is to just keep that going and, and uh, help them out to stay as fertile as they possibly can be. We're actually getting quite a few cow jokes in the comments. <laughs> uh oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I, I started yeah, that cool. Started. I'm sorry. Could he, hey, I want to hear the best one you got. Give me one. Uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm biased, so it's, I'll say my son's. <laughs> Which is where do cows watch TV? Do you know? At the, at the movies? No. What? No, Where? On the couch. <laughs> uh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah. You know. I think the one that, that uh, you need to tell for your kids is that what did the mommy cow say to the baby cow? It's I past your bedtime. Oh, that's right. There we go. <laughs> that's what. <laughs> Those cows are really content eating. You want to get down, buy one, and show us a cow munching? I'd be curious to get yeah, close. Yeah. This is a uh, Parma in front of us with the dark face. She's but uh, yeah, she. Wow. Yeah, she's munching some clover right now. That that is your that is your classic Jersey look. That's a classic looking Jersey right there. Oh, and there we go. Sadie's That's to the left. Up. Yeah. Let's see if we can yeah. get a cow bump there. She's gorgeous. So uh, cows, do they have teeth? Do they not have teeth? Uh, do they have a lot? How do they eat? Uh, they have teeth in the front, but only on the bottom. So they tear off their food. They grab a hold of it and they tear it off. So they basically pin the pin the uh, forage between their their uh, bottom teeth and their top gum, and they tear it off. They have to do a little rip and tear using their tongue as well. And then they have teeth in the back on both the top and the bottom that helps when they're chewing their cud uh that's what they used to chew the cud with and those are very powerful if you get your finger back in there you may lose your finger because they're very powerful uh you want to keep your fingers out from between those teeth because uh that's what they do a lot of lot of uh lot of uh Something. eating with yes i've been to a lot of farms and you know john is like the michael jordan or the tom brady of pasture managers you know like they're gorgeous um so this, the diversity, the, the lushness, it's amazing. It's so, it's such a um, great, great place to be for those cows. Okay, do we go to the silo? Yeah, sure, the let's go to the silo. fabulous Fisher or what, whatever. Uh, the, it, the old school vintage, you know, you vintage I think silo. I we've been getting the same ones up top here. That seems big, huh? Fisher Price, that's what <laughs> I wanted to say. All right, what do we got here? Is there an interesting story, John, about how this farm, your farm, became your farm? The story about how this farm became our farm was that uh, I went back to work for my father after college. And uh, after about three years, I started getting antsy to go out on my own. And, uh, and so we started looking for farms. Uh, but then the dairy economy got soft and dad, who was going to be helping bankroll me, uh, buy my place. He needed to co-sign for me. Thought it wasn't uh, the best time to do that. So we quit looking. Um, and But we'd had a whole bunch of uh, literature sent our way on farms. And we'd gone and visited a ton of different farms. And then we just uh, mothballed it all. Well, two years later, it became time to start looking again. And uh, I got a call from a realtor. 
and he said he had a farm, perfect little farm down in Monmouth, Oregon to show me. And uh, so, uh, got so a fly. I got a fly that wants, <laughs> that wants me, doesn't want the cows, wants me. Uh, but uh, so, so I came down, Julie, uh, my wife, Julie was uh, nine months pregnant and I came down to look at it by myself and I just fell in love with the place, but it just seemed like deja vu, like, like it'd been familiar, like I'd been here before. And I called Julie all excited. Uh, well, it was back before the days of cell phones. So I probably drove back home and got all excited with Julie and, uh, <laughs> and, and told her, but boy, it just seemed like uh, I'd been there before. It was like uh, something I'd just seen. And she goes to the file, pulls out this, the last farm that we had been sent information on. And it was this farm. And uh <laughs> It had been up for sale for two whole years and it actually was uh had been sold and then the buyer dropped out and uh between the time the buyer dropped out and uh this guy finding out the owner finding out that the buyer dro dropped out he'd sold all his cows and all of his equipment so uh when he put it back up for sale he needed to move it fast and luckily for us we were at the right place at the right time <laughs> Hi, cows. Um, awesome. How much milk a day do you get from a typical cow? Uh, and and I mean, we always talk in pounds. Yeah, so we're, we're a grass milk <laughs> dairy, which means we only feed forage. We don't feed any grain. And so we actually get less pounds per cow per day. Um, and that's kind of on purpose uh, because we're not feeding grain uh, because we want the the omega threes and CLAs to be higher in the milk because uh, some consumers really prefer that. And so our cows aren't pushed as hard. So uh, they'll probably average right at about five gallons a day, 40 pounds or so a day uh, on the average during the middle of winter, less than that. Uh, but they have higher butter fat percentage in the winter. So um, it all kind of evens out on that end. How does that compare to uh, grain fed? Uh, grain fed, we would, we could probably be having about a 55 pound average if we were feeding grain as well. Okay. So right. quite, it's, it's a, it's a fairly, it's about a two gallon a day difference. Okay. Uh, but with the, with the grass base, you get the added benefit of additional, uh, omega threes and sixes and the right, ba the right balance, I should say of omega threes and, and sixes. So, okay. And there is, Absolutely. Um, yeah, and if folks are interested in um, in learning more about uh, grass milk, uh, we don't have our grass milk carton here right now, but grass milk, uh, what John's family uh, supplies us to our grass milk line, 100% grass fed, they never get any grains. Um, and uh, if you're interested in some of the science behind that, some of the research that's been done on that milk, I would uh, recommend that you go to uh, uh, Google uh, University of Minnesota. They did a uh, independent study on grass fed um, based uh, uh, dairy systems. And uh, it gives a lot of good, uh, inf solid information about the difference between uh, grass-fed systems and, and others. And that's uh, third-party information. Uh, if you just Google grass-fed dairy, University of Minnesota study, you should be able to find it. So Awesome. All right. And then you being, you being a cheese guy, I yeah. uh, should appreciate this, that uh, the grass milk raw sharp cheddar is the best cheese I can put in my mouth. It is really special. That's good. Well, good cheese right there. I, I'm I, I'm glad you say that, and I would say that too. But John, like for for you and cows, like you can't really have a favorite, right? Like you can't have a favorite child. Like for me, our cheeses are the same thing. It's like they're all my children, and I I can't really pick favorites. But yes, I love our grass milk sharp cheddar. It, it's good. <laughs> I, I like the pepper jack personally. So yeah. <laughs> um, pepper jack's great. John. What keeps you motivated, like to, to farm every day? It's hard work, um, and and you guys get up. And Ross, how about actually? Let me ask Ross this, because I know John, you're you're a little quieter these days. Ross, what keeps you motivated to get out there and farm? Why why do you do it? Uh, I look forward to uh, seeing how this uh, the land we manage will come to fruition. Uh, and I have a a son now that just turned a year old, and you know if 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 uh, the world aligns and he wants to be a farmer, it, I'd love to see him uh, farm and continue on. So uh, yeah, that kind of is what gets me inspired. And I guess I really enjoy doing what I do. Um, you know, it's uh, it's kind of a unique, unique uh, occupation, but 
yeah, it's something I can't picture myself doing without. Um, and yeah, it is hard work, but uh, it's definitely rewarding when you can stand out in the middle of a pasture on a day like today, talk to the world and, you know, uh, and enjoy the sun and the cows. That is a fabulous ending um, to our National Farmers Day live stream. I mean, Ross, you know, we could not have said it better. I feel like I should just stop talking. So thank you, guys. <laughs> thank you very much. And thank you, everyone, for watching at home. We appreciate it. Happy National Farmers Day. Thank you, farmers, for what you do. Thank you all. We, we love you guys. Have a good one. We love all the farmers out there. Thank you. Thank you. There we go. Hey, bye. Happy bye. Farmers bye. Day. Bye. 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 Bye.